So the door is closed, thank you very much, and it's around 10.15 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time in the greater Washington area. So according to the agenda, it's time to start with the session on financing. I am Agnes Rupp from the National Institute of Mental Health, and I got the responsibility to chair this session. As a chair, I would like to welcome our panelists, the audience, and also those people who join us by WebEx across the country. As the chair of the session, I have several responsibilities. One of them is timekeeping. You probably know that the presenters have 15 minutes, and after the fifth presenter, we will have a 15-minute uh, time slot for asking questions, answering questions, and get engaged into a discussion. This being said, I would like to ask our first presenter, Yuho Abao, from Vail Cornell Medical College to talk about her research. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, great. <laughs> um, all right. Uh, so, uh, so wanted to rec uh, recognize our research team. This is probably the most multidisciplinary team I have ever worked with, and I really appreciate uh, the collaboration uh, of you know, uh, folks from New York State Psychiatric Institute, led by Dr. D uh, Lisa Dixon. Um, we would like to acknowledge funding from uh, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, the System for Action but also funding from an NIMH uh, one. And we thank Tom Smith uh, at New York State Office of Mental Health uh, for his very valuable assistance with this project. So I wanted to start with a very brief background uh, and then uh, going into a conceptual model for uh, paying for early interventions for psychosis. Um, and the, I guess the most unconventional part of this talk is to present to you a, a, a prototype for the payment tool. And we are, you know, everything here is work in progress, so I really look forward to your feedback. Um, so coordinated specialty care, or CSC, really changed the paradigm of treating early psychosis. Um, it follows the principles of recovery orientation, shared decision making, a team of specialists uh, uh, comprised of both clinicians and non-clinicians, uh, it has a very distinctive uh, objective to minimize duration of untreated psychosis. And, you know, consistent with these uh, principles, and has uh, several key service elements that go beyond the traditional clinical services, such as case management, supported employment education, and primary care coordination. And also, uh, in terms of core service processes, you have these specialized the training, community outreach, client and family engagement, mobile outreach and crisis intervention, and shared decision making. And as you can see immediately here that uh, a lot of these uh, service processes do not have existing payment mechanisms. Um, so I wanted to highlight several federal, uh, you, know, you know, kind of uh, milestones that really stimulated the adoption of evidence-based care for early psychosis. So in 2015, there are two congressional bills that uh, were passed to uh, allocate 5% of the mental health block grant, uh, equivalent to $25 million, as set aside uh, for implementation of early, early interventions. And this was followed by another bill in 2015, about a year later, that increased the, the you know, set aside to 10% of mental health block grant. And as you can see on the right-hand side, 
consistent with these uh, you know, milestones, you see a very dramatic increase in the number of states uh, starting to adopt early interventions uh, in starting from 2014. Uh, and it's uh, continued to increase after 2016, and by now almost every state uh, had, had at least a plan uh, to implement uh, you know, evidence-based interventions. And among these states was New York State, uh, and the uh, implementation, the statewide implementation uh, is known as On Track New York. Um, and so far, there are altogether 22 fully functioning teams uh, in New York State, both downstate, where the Im implementation started, and upstate, and in western New York. And as you can see here, that um, these teams kind of pretty much uh, concentrated in population centers. Um, there's still big chunks of the state that uh, are, are not served uh, you know, by a team so far. Um, so financing uh, early interventions for psychosis, uh, the current approach uh, remains kind of idiosyncratic. Uh, mental health block grant is certainly provides the very much needed stimulus, but itself is seriously inadequate for population-wide deployment. Uh, currently, CSC teams typically take a patchwork approach to financing. Um, this includes uh, the mental health block grant funding, uh, insurance billing for services that currently has a payment mechanism, uh, grants, and state and institutional supplements. Uh, scaling up and sustaining CSC calls for a payment system that, number one, adequately covers the cost of evidence-based care, number two, aligns incentives with patient-centered, recovery-oriented mm -hmm. approach, um, but also since the CSC practices really vary a lot, you know, from team to team or from jurisdiction to jurisdiction, uh, the, the payment system uh, needs to be tailored to uh, local preferences and practices. So um, back in 2014, uh, Frank Lee and McGuire, all these are the role models uh, for many of us here, uh, proposed a very valuable conceptual model for a multi-part payment system. Uh, the first part is uh, the so-called per case payment, which would cover team leadership, community outreach, case management, supported employment and education, services that are services that are traditionally not covered in the uh, you know, fee-for-service system. The second part is the per-service payment, uh, which covers a lot of times you know, visit-based uh, services, such as pharmacotherapy, psychotherapy, family psycho uh, psychoeducation. Uh, the third part is an incentive payment, or you know, outcome-based payment, uh, which rewards providers for achieving predefined outcome targets. Um, so this really lays the very nice conceptual uh, foundation for thinking about how to, you know, systematically finance or pay for uh, CSC. However, uh, if you think about the, if you, th how do I get out of here? If you think about the needs of uh, practitioners and you know payers there are several questions that that need to be answered for example on how well a payer administrator operationalize this model and uh, how much should the payment rate be uh, in order to you know cover the resource requirement but also align incentives um, how much would they expect to pay say over a three months uh, period um, so, these questions really motivated our project, which has like two uh, aims. One is to develop the analytical algorithms uh, of an innovative multi-part payment system for CSC. And the second uh, aim is to develop and pilot test a decision support tool uh, that enables CSC payers to tailor their payment design to local needs and circumstances. And uh, we used two unique sources of data from New York State, uh, from the OnTrack New York. Uh, the first source is OnTrack New York Medicaid Time Study, which was conduct conducted in June of 2017, about a year ago. And it sampled 73 uh, Medicaid clients, uh, which was stri stratified by acuity, that is how much time they have been in the program. Uh, it 
surveyed uh, detailed services and the duration, you know, the time that providers spent with each service to a given client over a two-week window. And uh, we also asked about, you know, the credential of the service provider. Uh, so this data, uh, you know, allows us to uh, assess the relative resource use uh, among different types of services, but also between clients of different acuity. And this, in turn, informs an analytical algorithms for a case rate payment. Um, on the other hand, we also, uh, you know, tapped into on-chart New York client assessments. And these uh, assessments were done every three months for each client enrolled in uh, OnTrack New York. And this assesses clinical, vocational, and other patient-centered outcomes. And this informs our outcome-based payment design. And I'm showing you some data from, you know, early data from OnTrack New York, uh, you know, containing 325 clients. And as you can see here, then over time, education and employment increased uh, for, uh, for clients. Uh, on the other hand, you know, hospitalization rate declined very dramatically from baseline to uh, three months and, and uh, uh, held uh, pretty uh, kind of uh, stable uh, over time. But I just wanted to call out to a presentation made, which will be made by Dr. Nozzle from uh, New York State Psychiatric Institute this afternoon in a, another session that will report on some updated data from Onshark New York. Um, so, showing, stop showing this. Um, yeah, so I, I just wanted to spend the rest of my time uh, showing you the tool because there's no substitution uh, for doing that. And uh, um, because I don't have access to a laptop, it's not going to work as a you know, ideally, <laughs> as it, it should be, so bear with me a bit. Um, so we start by, uh, this is supposed to be, when it's, in the, right now it's still a prototype, uh, when it's implemented into a real tool, it's, it's gonna be online and it's gonna be a, you know, users are going to be able to input their decisions and parameters. Um, so we start by telling the user about, you know, what's the purpose of doing this. Um, and then, and then we have a glossary page that we explain the different types of services that we, you know, are in, that are delivered on the CSC and should have a, some kind of a you know funding source, and we explain what the what fixed versus variable case rate are. And we also highlight that, you know, uh, you know, variable case rate could differ by the acu acuity of the clients, uh, meaning, you know, how much, how long they've been in the program. Then we move on and we tell them, we pre give them a warning about what kind of information they might need to complete this tool. And we also say that if you don't have this information at this time, you know, you can use the system default and what we tell them what the default are. And then we lay out the kind of the framework of the tool, of the payment system. We say that this tool is gonna help you design pretty much you know, up to two components of the tool, of the payment. Uh, one is a uh, must have or mandatory compo component, which is a case rate payment. And the other is an outcome based payment, uh, which is optional. So then we get started, and the first choice they're going to make in the case rate payment, which is must have, is to select the type of services to be covered under this case rate payment. For example, in this user choose to cover uh, these three types of services. And then we asked, uh, you know, do you want it to design, you know, a variable case rate, which varies by acuity, or a fixed case rate, which is a fixed per member per month uh, type of payment. Then, for example, this user says, okay, I wanted to have it as, you know, as a variable case rate so that we reduce risks to provider teams. Then we asked uh, them to input, to give us information about the makeup of their uh, CSA team uh, because, as I said previously, you know, the local practices of CSC vary you know, quite a bit. Um, 
And so we asked, okay, would you like to use the, you know, obviously we anticipated a lot of users when they use it for the first time, they might not have this information. So we say, okay, if you don't have the information, you can use our default information. And then, um, thank you. <laughs> And for both, uh, okay. So and and they say, okay, yeah, I want to use the default information, and uh, and then we provide them a default setup or makeup of the CSE team by credential, but also FTE based on New York State uh, experience. And here we uh, provide the option of you know for them to provide the local wage rates uh, because wage rates really differ a lot depending depending on where you look at. Uh, and then say, but we also have a button here for them to choose to have a national average wage rate uh, for these uh, professionals. Um, so then we move on. And this is a, the other option of, you know, inputting uh, custom information, which are just fly by. And then we ask them to provide more information about the local fringe rate, uh, indirect cost rate, and expected caseload. And then uh, we move on to the outcome-based maintenance. We ask them, okay, would you like to consider this component? If they said, okay, yes. Then we move on to have them make two choices, two decisions. Uh, one is uh, what kind of services you wanted to, what kind of outcomes you want to incentivize. And the other is how much of the case rate payment you wanted to withhold uh, or allocate to the outcome-based payment. And once they make all these choices, they're, they're ready to generate a, a payment report. And this payment summary report would present, will provide a summary of the, uh, of the design of their two parts of, of, the, of the payment system, and then uh, you know, kind of calculates the payments uh, for them over a defined period of time. So here it's three months. We have a black box warning at the bottom reminding them that, okay, you did not choose to cover community-based services in your case rate payment, and therefore teams will have to find other sources uh, to cover these costs. And we provide the, the, the option to either print it or save the scenario, and, and then they can start over again you know, for another scenario. Um, I hope I, you know, I'm not over time, <laughs> and uh, thank you very much. I know I did not have time to provide many details, but would be happy to get your feedback uh, during the question and answer. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much. I truly appreciate that I didn't have to use the timer. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll try to live up to that standard. <laughs> thank you very much. Oh. Can you go back one, please? Could you please go back? Yeah, thank you. Okay. Um, hi, I'm Susan Etner. I'm from UCLA, and I'm going to be talking today a little bit about what happens when um, employers switch from a managed behavioral health care. Is it working? Oh, okay. Oh, the clicker. Good. Ah, yes. Uh, managed behavioral health care carve out um, a model to a carve in model. Um, and I just want to quickly acknowledge my terrific co-authors, Hyung Xu and Francisca Azakar. Um, I want to acknowledge our uh, wonderful funders, um, NIDA. And I also want to point out that this is extremely preliminary work, so take the results with a grain of salt for now. Um, all right, let's see. Great. Okay, so first a little bit of background on behavioral health care carve-outs, which probably everybody in the room is familiar with, but nonetheless. Um, so managed behavioral health organizations introduced the carve-out model in the 1980s. In the traditional carve-in model, medical and specialty behavioral health care benefits were part of the same plan. They were administered together. Um, and in the carve-out model, what happened is that um, the specialty behavioral health care benefits got moved to a separate plan. So the medical and the behavioral health benefits were administered completely separately. Um, Carve-outs rapidly became very popular with 171 million covered lives. Uh, and there's a whole literature talking about the pros and cons of the different models. Um, some of the uh, potential advantages of the carve-out model were specialization, economies of scale, uh, the potential for protected funding. Um, typically, 
uh, carve outs, even if there were multiple uh, medical plans being offered, there would only be one specialty behavioral health care carve out, and that um, helped to prevent the um, issue, uh, problems with adverse selection and moral hazard. But there were also some potential downsides, uh, poor integration of care with the medical sector, um, perhaps further stigmatization of behavioral health care, higher administrative costs, and the potential for cost shifting. Um, a literature review of the impact of um, the MBHO model showed that there were higher penetration rates, but lower intensity of care in the carve-outs compared with carve-ins, and there was a mixed impact on quality. Um, we wanted to try using implementation of the Federal Mental Health Parity and Addiction Equity Act of 2008 as a type of natural experiment that um, might allow identification of the impact of MBHO model. Um, so what happened under this federal parity law is that compliance turned out to be more difficult for carve-outs. That's because um, they had to combine medical and behavioral health deductibles. And in a carve-out, often you're combining deductibles with a medical vendor with which you have no business relationship. It's not, it's not your sister company. It's some external medical vendor, and often it's multiple external medical vendors. Um, so you had to develop these systems to combine deductibles. And also you had to go to these other companies um, who sometimes were competing with your own sister medical vendor. Um, and get detailed benefit design information from them in order to make sure that you were complying with parity. And that also turned out not to be such a simple matter. So as I think probably an unintended consequence of the parity law, um, it became much more difficult to have a carve-out model. And as a result of that, some employers chose not to renew their carve-out contracts, but to go back to a carve-in model. Um, and for the natural experiment purposes, this is a good thing because it means that employers chose to switch from a carve-out model back to a carve-in model for reasons that were unrelated to the um, treatment patterns of their enrollees. It was sort of an exogenous decision based on um, these greater, the greater administrative burden of trying to comply with this parity law. So um, our study then um, was able to address two potential limitations of some of the earlier literature. It's not really limitations, but it's sort of complementary. So earlier literature had tried to address the issue of self-selection into MBHO model in other ways, but um, what we're trying to do is use this natural experiment so that we can argue that um, there won't be patient, um, that there won't be uh, uh, problems of patient self-selection into carve-in versus carve-out model that might have been based on unobserved factors related to service use and cost. This was basically a situation where the employer group moved everybody in the carve-out back into the carve-in for reasons unrelated to their spending patterns. Um, so that's the first advantage of using the natural experiment. And then the second advantage is that it gives us a it answers a slightly different question. So the earlier literature was all focused on the impact of moving from carve-in to carve-out model. But at this point, it's more relevant to know what happens when you move from a carve-out model back into a carve-in model. And the two effects are not necessarily symmetric. So we argue that this kind of adds to our, our knowledge in this area. Okay, so again, the question is, how does being transitioned from a carve-out to a carve-in model affect the specialty behavioral health care utilization and expenditures of commercially insured enrollees? Um, and this is an empirical question. It could go either way. You could make an argument either that the transitioned enrollees will use more care or more intensive care after they transition. Um, and the rationale there would be that carve-outs have tended to manage the care of their enrollees more carefully. And so if you move into a carbon model, perhaps there'll be less direct management of care and people will use more. Um, but you could also argue for the competing hypothesis, which is that they'll use less care and the rationale there is that, at least on paper, the carve-outs actually have tended to have more generous benefits. Um, and also, uh, in a carve-out model, uh, uh, primary care physicians have less um, disincentive to diagnose because if they diagnose psychiatric illness, they can refer off to the carve-out, and so there's not as much financial incentive within plan to, uh, um, to not want to recognize and treat um, the illnesses. So we partnered with the large managed behavioral health organization and its sister company, which was the medical vendor, to try to test these competing hypotheses. 
We analyzed three employer groups who chose to carve in with the MBHO's medical vendor instead of renewing their carve-out contracts following uh, parity implementation. There were other employer groups that chose to um, carve in, but they carved in with medical vendors for which we did not have data. Um, so we ended up with uh, three employer groups who had the data that we needed. Um, and again, the enrollees who were uh, employees and their dependents were transitioned, um, who were transitioned from the carve out to the carve in plan by the employer group were compared with enrollees from the same employers who had been enrolled in carve in plans both before and after the transition. Um, and I'll talk more about the comparison group later on and the limitations. Um, so sources of data, we had 2008 through 14 eligibility files and specialty behavioral health claims and th those were linked to the MBHO's book of business which gave in us information about the employer groups and plans. Very quickly, this is the sample size flow chart. We started off with almost 3 million. We excluded people for things like discontinuous enrollment. Um, we wanted to um, exclude the very young and, and older folks. Um, we looked at people within the 50 states. The plan had to have behavioral health benefits because we also had EAP data. Um, we excluded the ones that were not subject to um, to parity and we wanted people, because we're using fixed effects models, we wanted people who had at least an observation before and after the transition. Um, and in the end, we ended up with almost a million um, uh, person year observations. Um, I'm gonna go through this really quickly because I'm on a short leash here. Um, but I just wanted to show descriptive statistics for, these are our, all of our outcome measures. So we have um, annual expenditures, total plan and patient, um, we have outpatient service use in visits um, for several different kinds of services, and then we also have um, service use in days for other kinds of intermediate care and inpatient care. And if you compare the, um, the means for those who were transitioned from carve-out to carve-in plans with the means for those who were always enrolled in the carve-in plans, um, they look fairly similar. Um, these are... Um, these are pre-transition, so at baseline, they look, they look fairly similar, especially the dollar amounts. Okay, so what we did was we estimated difference in differences regression models. Um, these were linear regressions with individual fixed effects to account for time invariant population differences in use, costs, and demographics. There were some differences in demographics. For example, um, those who transitioned were younger and less likely to be male. Um, we adjusted for constant term and year fixed effects. Um, the variance was adjusted for employer level clustering um, using GEE. And um, the difference in difference estimate of the impact of the carve out transition was the coefficient on an interaction between an indicator for post transition period and an indicator for being in the transition group. And I should note that the transition um, year was slightly different for um, Two group, I forget which way it goes, but two groups were transitioned one year and then one group was transitioned the next year. Okay, so these are the, um, these are the main results. Um, we have other sensitivity analyses that I, I won't show you, but these are the main findings. And as you can see, the, um, the statistically significant effects at P equals 0.05 are shown in bold italics. And so you can see that we really found significant effects only um, for two types of services. We found a significant reduction in day treatment, um, which is intermediate care, and then we found a significant increase in um, inpatient care. And while on the one hand those, um, those results, did I have a, no, oh no, I, I guess there's no, uh, wait, what was that? I, I don't see it, sorry, that's okay. Um, I'll just point to it. <laughs> so while well, these, the magnitudes of these estimates look uh, small up there, but actually compared to the baseline levels, they are actually quite large. So, um, so there, was, um, there was a pretty significant, um, uh, it looks like there's some substitution going on there. Okay, so again, just to resummarize my findings, the main effects of the transition from the carve-out to the carbon model were a decline in the use of day treatment, an increase in the use of inpatient care. Um, in absolute terms, those magnitudes of effect look small, but um, relative to baseline values, they're actually large. Um, we did not find a significant net impact on total costs, um, which surprised us a little bit, but when we looked specifically at inpatient costs, we did actually find that 
um, there was a significant increase in the out-of-pocket inpatient costs and a marginally significant increase in the total inpatient costs. Um, plan, uh, plan costs went up, but it wasn't significant. Um, so that was consistent with seeing the increase in the, um, the utilization side. And it could be that the lack of significant impact on overall costs is because the increased inpatient utilization appears to be at least partially offset by a, a decline in day treatment. Um, so I want to point out that in the pre-transition period, the enrollees who were already in the carbon plan did have higher inpatient use. Um, and this is consistent, by the way, with the prior literature on this topic, that the carbon enrollees tended to have higher inpatient use. So it makes sense that we also found that the people already in the carbon had higher inpatient use, and once people were transitioned from carve out to carve in, their inpatient use went up. That's all consistent with the earlier literature. Um, there are certainly some uh, potential study limitations. As I noted before, and of course in a difference in differences model, the control group is important because um, even if people don't have to start off at the same place, you do have to assume that their secular time trends are going to be the same. We're still exploring this. Um, in unadjusted data, it looks like some of the time trends are similar and some aren't. And um, we're um, looking at ways to maybe use propensity score matching to improve that. Um, it, there's also potential lack of generalizability, um, even though we start with, you know, a huge ma managed behavioral health organization, but, you know, the employer groups that we ended up studying were only three. They were pretty large because we had almost a million um, observations that we used, but still. Um, uh, there could have been selection at the employer group level. I think um, that, m to my mind, is less likely of a limitation than, say, the non-comparable non time trends. Um, and then, of course, we have, you know, we have claims data. So we don't have data on prescriptions, quality of care, functional outcomes, quality of life, and so on. Okay, last slide. Um, so policy implications. Um, we found some evidence that transitioning to carbon plans increased use of inpatient services without increasing at least the overall cost of care. Um, this may have been due to a concomitant reduction in the use of day treatment. Um, the notable reduction, and it was, it was definitely noticeable, um, in the popularity of carve-out models following the implementation of the federal parity law was likely an unintended consequence of it. Um, and it, you know, may or may not have been um, a happy thing. <laughs> so, but based on our findings, there's at least reason to be optimistic that this move away from carve-out models back to carbon models was at least a, had a neutral impact and possibly in some ways even a beneficial impact for patients in terms of access to care. So again, we don't know whether those marginal hospitalizations that are, appear to be increasing are cost effective or not, but at least it looks like there's less concern to be um, worried that they are um, uh, lacking uh, access to inpatient care. Um, the impact, the negative impact on day treatment, however, is something that would need to be further explored. And that's it. And again, if you have questions, please um, contact me and uh, I'll have a paper hopefully soon for us. Did I make it on time? Uh, I need to mention that uh, Marissa will not be able to stay for the entire session uh, due to scheduling conflict. So I try to be flexible, although uh, dealing with the timing is very strict. So after her presentation, there will be two, three minutes to ask questions if you wish. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Let me try standing here. Um, thank you for being here, and thank you, Agnes, uh, for putting together this session. It's an honor to be included. Um, and I'm delighted to talk to you about some recent work that we've been doing on accountable care organizations. Um, let's see. Um, so this study uh, was funded by PCORI, and we're grateful for their uh, assistance. Um, I also want to acknowledge, as part of the PCORI study, we had an amazing patient advisory panel um, of caregivers because I'm going to talk about children with disabilities and their caregiver advocates were just really inspiring and really made this 
um, an interesting and important um, project to work on. Um, so there are a number of collaborators on this paper, um, which again is very much in progress, so I look forward to your questions and feedback. Um, so without further ado, um, I'm going to talk about the implementation of an accountable care organization um, for uh, uh, a Medicaid program in Ohio that was targeted for children uh, with disabilities. Um, so children with disabilities are a very heterogeneous group with a broad mix of uh, diagnoses. Um, you know, and require a substantial amount of care coordination uh, and help, assistance in putting the package of services together uh, by caregivers often, but also sometimes by the formal health care system, sometimes by informal systems such as uh, other agencies in the county or perhaps even the school districts that they're involved in. Um, but typically, uh, it's the families, uh, the caregivers, who serve as the main care coordinator. Um, so what we're going to talk about is an accountable care organization, which probably is no surprise to people in this room, you know, as a group of providers that take responsibility for the care of a defined population. Um, typically, they're set up with benchmarks that the plans are uh, incentivized to meet. Uh, and when they do, they can share in any savings that may occur from efficiencies in providing care. So the idea is to build on the typical HMO or, or capitated managed care model uh, by providing benchmarks to try to further enhance uh, both the quality of services received as well as uh, generating savings um, from efficient care um, use typically shifts towards more community-based care than inpatient care. Um, so one of the elements of the secret sauce in an ACO model um, really is care coordination. So again, to try to get uh, populations into community-based and lesser expensive alternatives to care uh, rather than waiting till they need more reactive, you know, tertiary care kinds of services. Um, so we know a lot about ACOs by now through the Medicare program primarily. Um, uh, so there's been an alphabet soup of, of federal demonstrations that occurred for programs like the MSSP, the Medicare Shared Savings Program, Pioneer, there's now Next Generation um, ACOs. So there's different flavors of ACOs with different types of risk packages for the health plans. Um, but they also are starting to be used in Medicaid programs. So this is the graph that was generated earlier this calendar year. Uh, and the orange states, I don't know if you can read the little header up there, are states that are currently implementing ACOs in their Medicaid program to at least some of the Medicaid population. The blue states are states that are considering it. So we're here in Maryland. Uh, Maryland uh, is a state that was uh, recorded as considering an ACO. Um, for the Medicaid program. I'll come back to this graph in just a moment. Um, so the state I'm going to talk about is Ohio. Um, so what happened in Ohio is prior to July 2013, um, children with disabilities were in typical fee-for-service kind of Medicaid benefit packages. Um, but on July 13th, two things happened. Uh, the state went entirely towards capitated managed care, so uh, children, for children with disabilities. So statewide, there was a shift from fee-for-service to capitated managed care. But on the same date, in one region of the state, the southeast and central region of the state, um, in particular 34 counties, um, together uh, formed a subcapitation agreement with an accountable care organization who had experience providing and managing care for children. Um, so it's called Partnered for Kids, but I'll typically refer to it as the ACO model. Um, so the subcapitation agreement put the ACO at risk uh, for the expenses of this population, as well as included additional payments for uh, care coordination. Uh, so what our study design is, is comparing children who shifted from fee-for-service Medicaid to ACO care versus children who uh, shifted from fee-for-service Medicaid to simple capitation without an ACO uh, add-on. Um, 
we focus here, we've done an analysis for all children who were shifted uh, through this alternative payment model, um, but today I'm going to talk about children who had mental health or substance use disorder diagnoses. And I will tell you 97% of our kids uh, had mental health diagnoses. So this is mostly mental health uh, and not a hugely uh, substance use um, diagnosis population. Uh, oh, I should mention, uh, so we ended up, they're just short of 40,000 kids uh, who are uh, included in this sample. Uh, so let me just go back. Uh, you'll note that Ohio is not highlighted here uh, because technically the ACO is not state implemented. It was implemented by the managed care plan. So in, in a sense, that shows you that this graph maybe underrepresents the number of ACO models that actually are used in state Medicaid programs. Um, so here's a map of Ohio uh, and all of its counties, and the gold counties are our intervention counties. So you can see they're more towards the Appalachian region. Um, you know, it may have other differences uh, in the population than the rest of the state, which again is the control um, for our study uh, that shifted to capitated managed care without an ACO. Um, so again, we had a wonderful uh, patient advisory panel. Uh, the, the patients, you know, it was really the caregivers involved because the patients were children. Um, and they were really involved all the way through the study. So, you know, they helped with, um, you know, setting up our research questions, uh, the research design. You know, we met with them very regularly about interpreting, interpreting our findings, um, helping find stakeholders who were interested in the results. Um, and really just, you know, made sure that our research uh, is patient-centered. Um, and so we're grateful for their contributions. Um, and they, you know, suggested a number of outcomes that I'm going to talk about today. So in particular, home health receipt was not on our radar screen, but was, you know, very much important to caregivers um, to help manage this population. They were also very interested in the receipt of seizure disorder medication, which I included here as an outcome. Um, let me skip over this. This just shows kind of the activities during the three-year study period. Um, so one thing that always comes up with policy analysis is that, you know, we as researchers are very aware of a switch to an alternative payment model. The state who's implementing this is obviously very aware of it, but is the population affected aware of a policy change? And so that was one question we put um, to our stakeholders, uh, and in particular, we had surveys uh, that I'm not going to talk about of caregivers, as well as some interviews with caregivers across the state. Um, and so some things didn't change with this model. Um, the caregivers remain the primary care coordinators despite the change in funding and possibly um, the ability to receive care coordination. Um, we know that the children's disabilities had considerable impact on their caregivers. Um, most of them seemed aware of this change when it was happening, so most recalled receiving a letter about the upcoming change, um, and then after the change, you know, most were aware of the policy change, and they expressed concerns related to changes in coverage that they might experience in shifting from fee-for-service to capitated care. Um, not many families reported receiving formal care coordination prior to the policy change, and those who did said that they got them from other sources rather than, you know, directly from the Medicaid plan, sometimes from their provider offices, um, but often from the county boards, which provided um, care coordination services. Um, afterwards, I do have to say that, and this might preview a little bit of our results, um, they told us that they really did not feel that they used care coordination much from the accountable care organization. Um, and some of that may be the perception of what's going on behind the scenes by the managed care entity versus what the families are experiencing. Um, okay, so our research question is what effect does an ACO contract have on health care and outcomes for children with behavioral health diagnoses? Um, and we thought that um, you know, ACOs having benchmarks and having an extra incentive to provide quality care and um, care coordination, we would see greater use of appropriate services and lesser use of inappropriate services. Um, so 
we use Medicaid claims data. We had encounters because Ohio uh, is one of the states that does have a carved out system, actually until uh, a month ago today, uh, where they carved back in. Um, and we have enrollment data from the Medicaid program. Um, we looked at starting two years before the ACO was implemented to three years afterwards, so uh, July 2011 to June 2016. Um, and we focused on children who were Medicaid eligible by virtue of being in the aged, blind, and disabled um, program. So the A obviously doesn't apply for children, uh, but I'll continue to use that acronym. Um, there were a few kids who were enrolled in managed care before, largely because of shifts in their Medicaid eligibility, um, and then some kids were exempted out of managed care after the implementation change, and we took both groups out of our data. Um, so we have almost 24,000 person-year observations for ACO participants and almost 70,000 person-year uh, observations for controls. Um, we also use difference and difference models uh, because of some differences in some of the socio-demographic characteristics in our sample. We use person fixed effects uh, to control for selection bias, um, although it was a natural experiment. So every, every kid in those regions who weren't exempted out uh, because of a waiver, um, you know, were shifted to the ACO. Um, and we looked at measures of access to primary care, access to specialty mental health care, use of the emergency department, and use of psychotropic medications. Um, we looked at the parallel trends assumption to make sure our control group was an adequate, adequate control group and found no evidence of difference in trends in the pre-period between the two regions. Um, as I mentioned, we use fixed effects to control for uh, uh, shifts in the levels. Um, we also use the, the technique proposed by Stewart and colleagues in an HS, uh, HSORM article a few years ago uh, where you do propensity score matching based on pre-post case control status, so one of the four groups there, um, and found largely consistent results with what are um, shown here. So I'm showing you the not propensity weighted results. Um, so just to look at the level of use, so I'm just showing you controls here. So you can see that you know almost 80% of our sample um, had primary care use in a year. Uh, we were actually surprised it wasn't higher given that these are kids with disabilities, but this is consistent with some of the survey information that we got from parents you know, who we did find a non-trivial uh, minority of uh, individuals in sample who, although they were qualified through aged, blind, and disabled, they didn't use primary care services. Um, a, a pretty big group, so over 65%, almost 70%, use specialty mental health services, so a lot of mental health um, use. Um, a lot of emergency department use, not quite 50%, but getting close. And this is, again, any use in a typical year. Um, and then the psychotropic medication. So uh, about a fifth of the sample used antidepressants, a small group used anxiolytics, uh, a bigger group, almost a third, used antipsychotic medications, and ADHD medication use was very high uh, in this group. So here are the difference in differences results. Um, so after the carve out, we actually saw a reduction in uh, primary care access. Um, again, I want to note the scale here because these are percentage point differences, so you should think about them, as Susan pointed out, sort of relative to the baseline numbers I just showed you. So this is about not quite a 2% percent percentage point decrease over a baseline of 80%. So, you know, in relative terms, a, a somewhat modest um, result, but statistically significant decrease. Um, we saw a fairly large decrease in the use of specialty mental health services after ACO implementation in the ACO group as compared to the capitated managed care group. Um, and also an increase in emergency department use. So these are all going the wrong direction, right? These are, this is not what we want to see um, if this is improving quality of care. Um, and we really found no difference in the use of psychotropic medications. You know, little um, increases, but not statistically significant in the two classes of medication we'd probably want to see increases in uh, and decreases in the two classes that, you know, we might want to see decreases in. Um, but again, not enough evidence to say that they're statistically significant. Um, so I just said this in words. Um, so... 
uh, you know, while we see somewhat modest changes in use, they're not in the right direction, um, and they do suggest a decline in the use of community care, so that's a concern. Um, and especially given that we see more and more ACOs being implemented in Medicaid programs, um, one of the things we're worried about is maybe the benchmarks aren't really motivating the kinds of care that we want to see in behavioral health. So we know that the vast majority of benchmarks um, are on the physical health side and so possibly not enough incentive to pay attention um, to kids who have behavioral health, kids and adults who have behavioral health conditions. Um, so let me stop there. Um, so um, I'm a primary care physician and a uh, mental health re researcher and um, you know one of the things that strikes me about um, the talks that have been given and I'll focus on yours but um, is that they um, they talk about these uh, changes which in you know from my perspective are a great opportunity to increase access for common mental disorders um, uh, which is a little bit different from a lot of what the focus is, has been on these talks and um, so that's just one point. But your, my question for you, you just uh, posited that you would expect the incentives, you know, that because of the physical health focus, um, that, that maybe that's a problem for the mental health stuff, but you actually showed evidence that there was a decrease in primary care use. So, you know, the, I'm, I'm not sure that covers everything. There might be other incentives that are problematic, and I just wonder about the transition and the, you know, bumps in the road that, uh, we, that hopefully we'll get uh, even out as we go forward. So. I'm not sure if this is on. Yeah, it seems on. Um, so, to address the first question, um, these are you know these tend to be more disabled children, so I wouldn't describe them as sort of more moderate mental illnesses. These are kids who qualify for Medicaid because of a disability, and so will pick up kids with severe emotional disturbance if that was the disability that qualified them for Medicaid, as well as kids who qualified by virtue of a physical health impairment um, but also have a mental health um, issue. So, so I tend to think of this as being a more disabled population, but again, you know, the fact that 20% didn't see a primary care provider tells me something. In terms of the other issue, um, our, our general results for the full population, we actually found no difference in primary care use, so the ACO neither advantaged nor disadvantaged kids, including this group, but also including the much bigger group of kids with other kinds of disabilities. Um, and we actually found a greater rate of using well child visits for adolescents. Um, so, so in the full population, the ACO was fairly positive. Um, so, you know, that, that's probably context that helps us kind of get to the point that we think something different is going on in this population. Um, we have three years of data. We've looked to see if things were different in year one versus year three, and actually the trends are really very similar. So it isn't just a transition period issue. You just mentioned that you had three years of data since the transition. Did you also look at three years of data prior to the transition? I'm just trying to get an idea of how variable this is, because you did see, you know, two and f to f four percent differences in access. And so, is that is it that really significant? Not statistically, but based on kind of what you see in terms of trends in the population. So I think those are different issues. We only had two years of pre-data because of a health information system issue, so they actually changed vendors and the way they managed data, so we would have liked to have had three years uh, pre, but we didn't. Um, having said that, I don't think it really matters because our primary comparison is the cases versus the controls in a sense. So while we use the pre-data to establish trends, I think two years is more than enough to establish trends in that population. Um, so, yeah. Another question. I wonder whether the decline in mental health services use might be related to care coordination functioning as kind of an early intervention model in the sense of a direct frequent contact with families may identify incipient uh, symptoms of distress and actually just the 
even just um, a sort of a support model might have deflected some of those families you know, from a trajectory where they would have sought services to make perhaps spontaneous recovery? Yeah, it's a great question, and I don't have a good answer because, in a sense, what we have is a black box. So we don't know. We can't look under the lid of what was really going on with care coordination to these families and to know more about that. So, um, you know, we're doing what we can to address that, but I think, uh, you know, it remains a concern that we'll have to look at in a, in a different kind of study. But thank you very much. All right, thank you. Thank you. Somebody controls this, but I don't know who. Okay, our <laughs> next presenter is uh, Alan Newton from Dartmouth. Thank you. Uh, clock's ticking, so good morning. Um, I'm Helen, I'm from the Dartmouth Institute, and I hope that this evidence from a 2017 survey is actually pretty complementary to what Marissa just press presented on. Ooh, it's quicker. Um, so in this talk, I'd like to first go over um, the brief motivation for this question, sort of why ACO contracts and collaborative care are potentially related, and describe the theory, briefly describe this new survey instrument, and then spend the bulk of our time looking at findings and kind of discussing new directions for this paper. So I believe there's a whole talk dedicated tomorrow to <laughs> collaborative care, um, but I think it suffices to say, particularly to this audience, that um, managing both physical and mental comorbidities for this patient population is really important um, and a rigorous and evidence-based intervention. And we know that novel payment strategies like ACOs may motivate expansion of collaborative care. So in this paper, we asked two questions. First, how common are these strategies um, associated with collaborative care in ACOs in the most recent contract year, so 2017 to 2018, and specifically considering models to both treat depression and anxiety, but also more severe mental illness? And then second, what ACO contract features are associated with the use of these strategies, and specifically um, considering payer type, quality measures, and the level of risk. So I first want to take a moment to define collaborative care. In our survey, we focused on the impact model developed at the University of Washington, um, and sort of refers to this team-based approach um, that should read care manager, um, sorry. So using a care manager to enhance patient education and coordinate care, having a consulting mental health clinician, and then finally having a patient registry to track depressive symptoms. And this is to manage depression in a primary care setting. We also considered a parallel model that's specific to managing patients with serious mental illness and especially mental health setting, and there the goal is to improve access to physical health. And so using a co-located primary care provider and using a registry to track physical health symptoms rather than to track mental health symptoms. So briefly, you know, a lot of the evidence that has focused on collaborative care has really been on the right-hand side of this slide and sort of understanding how care processes around care collaboration or collaborative care impact patient-level outcomes. And the purpose of this paper is much more upstream, so how features of ACO contracts can affect um, the development and implementation of care processes like collaborative care. So to reiterate, we'll not be focusing on outcomes today, but much more sort of understanding the relationship between contract features and collaborative care strategies. So focusing upstream is important. I think this audience is well aware of the challenges that exist in accessing mental health services. There are a few listed here. And there has been some early evidence kind of going into what Marissa said, examining whether ACOs, which potentially should improve integration of services, actually do lead to integration of behavioral health services for their attributed patient population. This evidence has been fairly mixed and suggests that integration of behavioral health services is pretty limited. However, there are certain contract features that potentially increase the likelihood of integration, specifically taking on downside risk. Um, the challenge in this early evidence is um, twofold. First is pretty general, just asked whether providers and the ACOs were integrating behavioral health services, didn't really differentiate between different populations with mental illness or differentiating between patients with addiction versus mental health conditions, um, and similarly didn't really ask certain strategies used to integrate care. So um, the team at Dartmouth, in addition to Berkeley and Michigan and Yale, 
we developed wave four of the National Survey of Accountable Care Organizations, um, which importantly included a whole section dedicated to behavioral health and asked two primary domains first, what contract features specific to mental health and addiction treatment delivery were ACOs providing? Um, and second, what organizational strategies were specific to mental health and addiction treatment like potential indicators of collaborative care? Another important component of the Wave 4 NASCO um, is that it sampled the greatest sample of ACOs than any previous wave. Um, so now that we're in year five after ACO implementation, there are an estimated 867 eligible ACOs. Um, so of this sample, 56 return survey, 56 percent return surveys, and of um, 48 percent completed surveys, by which I mean they completed at least 50 percent of the core questions. And there were significant differences by contract type, with a much more much higher response rate amongst the ACOs with a Medicare contract than those with a non-Medicare contract. So we had five items that assess collaborative care strategies, and there's sort of two parallel sets of items. Um, and in both cases, we asked respondents to first consider their patients with depression, anxiety, or serious mental illness, like schizophrenia or bipolar disorder. Um, report in which setting do these patients most frequently receive care, and then also tell us what strategies um, they are using to integrate care. And so using the responses to these questions, we were able to answer our first research question, how common these strategies are um, after adjusting for non-response, and we were able to differentiate by patient population. And we then used the associations between these five collaborative care strategies and reported contract features um, to predict the use of collaborative care strategies using a Poisson model while adjusting for both the size of the ACO and sort of scale of operation. So um, to jump ahead to findings, in thinking about models to integrate services for patients with depression and anxiety, we found that on average, ACOs are reporting a little more than two and a half of these five strategies. Your average ACO um, reported using a care manager for mental health needs, a care manager for non-medical needs, and also a mental health clinician consulting the primary care provider. Um, as you can see from this graph, the patient registry was the least likely reported strategy to integrate services. The distribution looks a little bit different for strategies around um, managing integration or managing services for patients with serious mental illness. On average, ACOs reported f using fewer strategies, about two rather than two and a half. Um, the average ACO was likely to report using a care manager for physical health needs and a care manager for non-medical needs. And using a co-located primary care provider was the least likely reported strategy to integrate services. Before jumping into contract features, I want to spend a little bit of time kind of comparing and contrasting the responses to these strategies. So for patients with serious mental illness, ACOs were much more likely to report seeing them in a specialty mental health setting versus seeing patients with depression or anxiety in a primary care setting. They're also much more likely to report using a registry to track symptoms. Perhaps a little concerningly, ACOs were less likely to report using a care manager from non-medical needs. Um, and then ACOs were also much more likely to report using a care manager to use physical health needs rather than reporting use of a co-located primary care provider. In comparison, there was actually a lot of concordance between use of a, both a mental health um, consulting clinician in addition to a care manager for mental health needs in the treatment of depression and anxiety in a primary care setting. So I apologize, this slide is pretty busy, um, but I wanted to show you the distribution of contract features per the number of strategies reported by ACOs to integrate services for depression and anxiety. And so um, we looked at both payer type in addition to quality measures, inclusion in total cost of care, reported downside risk, and then also contracting or carving out mental health care. And because these are specific to the payer, you see that um, we separated by payer in each case. I'm not going to spend a lot of time, but I wanted to talk a little bit about the trends. So as you can see, there's an increasing number of sort of mean quality measures reported by increasing number of strategies. And then for each of the subsequent contract features, 
there's the distribution is sort of shifted where the majority of respondents that either include mental health and total cost of care, report taking on downside risk, or report carving out care, are using two or more of these collaborative care strategies. The table looks pretty similar for the collaborative care strategy specific to patients with SMI. Um, again, there's a similar increasing trend of reported quality measures per number of strategies reported. However, in terms of the subsequent contract features, the distribution is shifted slightly to the left, where the majority of respondents who include any of these contract features are, on average, report fewer of these collaborative care strategies, so are likely to be employing anywhere from zero to three collaborative care strategies for SMI. The story in the models is largely the same. Um, I think one thing stood out to us to note in that almost none of these contract features were actually significant in the model. Um, and really the only piece that was significant was the number of mental health related quality measures. Um, and this was significant both Medicaid and commercial contracts and this bore out after adjusting for size and scale of the ACO. The effect here is pretty modest. Um, you know, with each additional mental health quality measure, there is an additional 2% likelihood of in reporting a collaborative care strategy to manage depression. There is a parallel story with the SMI model, where again, the level of risk was not associated with the predicted use of collaborative care. And again, while mental health related quality measures were significant in both Medicaid and commercial contracts, before adjusting for size and scale, they only remained significant after um, adjusting for size and scale in the commercial model. And here the effect size is slightly larger than um, in the depression model, but again, relatively modest at just 5%. So a couple key takeaways from this paper. You know, most ACOs report employing at least two collaborative care strategies and relatively few provide the full suite of collaborative care services. This largely ties in with some early evidence um, from 2014, 2015, where around half of ACOs reported integrating services. Um, of note, ACOs are more likely to report using collaborative care strategies to manage patients with depression and anxiety rather than serious mental illness. Um, and the number of mental health quality measures included in the contract does seem to matter, um, particularly for commercial contracts, though the level of risk we did not determine to be associated with the use of collaborative care. We still don't know what the relationship is with outcomes, unfortunately. There are a couple of limitations in this paper. Um, you know, limitations common to all survey data, particularly selection bias. Um, as I mentioned before, we, didn't know, we did not link to either the publicly reported ACO quality measures nor to patient level outcomes. Um, and then also, we have kind of a limited exposure to a Medicaid-specific population. You know, Marissa showed that slide of kind of distribution of Medicaid ACOs. And um, the other thing that that slide doesn't necessarily portray is most um, ACOs that have a Medicaid contract also have contracts with multiple other pairs. There are very few Medicaid-specific ACOs. Um, and so this is certainly a limitation. However, I think this paper is just a start. I think in um, sort of future steps, we'd like to spend a little more time addressing selection bias using the NASCO data. Um, we've already adjusted for non-response. Um, I think it's become clear that ACOs are incredibly heterogeneous, so we're sort of thinking about how to match our sample to adjust for some of these size and scale issues. Um, we'd also like to link to outcomes, um, both from the sort of publicly known quality measures for Medicare ACOs, but also to patient level data for our Medicaid ACOs. And then finally, we'd like to survey providers that are sort of wholly focused on a Medicaid population. We're surveying providers participating in New York's DISRIP program um, with this aim of trying to compare and contrast how their use of collaborative care is related to ACO's use of collaborative care. Um, so in conclusion, a third of ACOs are using four to five collaborative care strategies to manage depression and anxiety, whereas just 12% are using these same strategies to manage patients with SMI. We think that increasing number of mental health related quality measures in the contract um, increases the probability of reporting these care processes that suggest use of a collaborative care model, but the level of financial risk is not associated with collaborative care use. 
I'd really like to thank my advisor and co-author, Ellen Mira, um, co-authors Donovan Moss and Susan Bush, and the Dartmouth NASCO team. Survey is a huge lift, so I really thank them. Um, and this work was supported by the NIMH, and the contents are own and not necessarily the official views of the NIH, and also the survey was um, received financial support from the Commonwealth Fund. Thank you. Last presenter is Chi Chen. Hello. So the talk of the title of my talk is Evidence of Cost Effective Public Health Integrated Model for People with Mental Illness. I would like to acknowledge the uh, funding from NIMH uh, and also my amazing team who helped contribute to this research. So today I would like to uh, present the main findings of our R21 project and uh, very briefly to go over the uh, background is that we know the high prevalence of mental disorders and the people have mental disorders often have coexisting physical conditions and also fo following Tom McGuire's and NIOM report in early 2000 racial and ethnic um, disparities in mental health care have been very well documented in the literature so usually lack of health care access and the social stigma are the main sources that to explain the disparities so we will, uh, so for this R21 project, we propose a patient-centered multi-level framework. So we think it is, a, a, again, a care coordination model, and we will uh, link the multiple data sources at the individual level, healthcare professional and the hospital community and local health department level to see uh, uh, the, uh, the association of the local health department, public health system, what they can do to improve the mental health care. So our focus is the local health department. Why do we focus on that? Because we think they can uh, provide sustainable uh, resources in the community and it will be helpful to have this long-term relationship with the community residents and increase the trust and the engagement of the, of the patient in their own health care. And also for minority populations, often local health departments serve as a safety net and the uh, yeah, safety net for, for the populations to access the mental health care. But their role has often been neglected, although they kind of like the center of the community interventions. So, so in this R21 project, we explore their role and I will present several studies that we have been conducted related to this topic and I will present the main findings for the time concern. So the first study we do is we would like to see whether the public health intervention and the integration can related to some cost saving. Uh, so we, we use the nationally representative data set, the medical expenditure survey, which is an individual level analysis. And for each individual level, we will link that to their community they lived in by zip codes. So whether in their community, their local health department have been actively involved in providing mental health care preventive services. So the other main data sources that we use is the natural data, which provided the local health department's measurement. So there are activities in providing mental health care and other services. So that's the main data set we linked by the zip code level. So very briefly to go over the natural survey which covers 78 uh, percent percent of the local health department in the United States which almost cover 90 percent of the US populations uh, they served. And the key role that we focus in this paper is that their direct involvement in providing population-based pr uh, prevention for mental health services, which can include uh, the initial screening and uh, the follow-up, the monitoring outcomes, or providing some case management and the follow uh, uh, after, after, the, uh, after screening and uh, the uh, referrals. So these are the main outcome, uh, the key independent variable we look at. So the main finding is that, uh, so it, it, is, uh, it is a multi-level analysis. So the outcome variable that I will present today is the total health care expenditure per person per year. That's the uh, variable information from the medical expenditure panel survey. And then we use the uh, multi-level analysis to control for individual factors which have been very well documented in the literature by Anderson social behavioral model and also local health department characteristics as well as the uh, zip code and the county state policy factors that have been well established in the literature. So a little bit jump into the, um, the, the main finding here is that 
uh, by the way, we conducted all sorts of the model specifications and the various sensitivities. And, uh, and you can see the underlying other factors, the other control variables that we have been controlled for, like the, uh, the multi levels. And the GRM model was used, and uh, we used the mar we predict the marginal effects. And uh, the, uh, the association is actually quite significant. It's basically saying that if the individual living areas with active support from the local health department uh, by providing the mental health prevention. On average, their uh, annual health care expenditures were $800 lower compared to individuals that are living in areas without such, uh, such support by their local health department. Okay, so, so I think, uh, of course, uh, yeah, the, the limitation is that it is a cross-sectional analysis. So I don't want to say there's a causality. I, although we have been trying very best to, to run all sorts of model specifications and try to control the uh, variables, but still there can be omitted the variables. However, this is the first study I think to establish this association. Kind of think of maybe you know, public health involved uh, or public health-led initiatives to providing the mental health prevention can be cost-saving. So this is not uh, expensive program, but it probably will lead to you know, huge cost saving in the future and for the community. So to further, step, uh, so the following study then we say, okay, then let's see whether the local health department, they are pr providing the mental health prevention can relate to the differences in the hospital utilization patterns. So we use the state of Maryland data of the uh, hospital uh, hospitalizations, which is a H cup uh, state inpatient data, we, we examine the 30 day all course readmission rate in the state of Maryland. Maryland has 24 counties, 24 local health departments, so they all vary by their responsibility of how they function in their own county and providing mental health services. So, uh, so we use the same approach, so by linking the uh, 30 day all course readmission with local health departments uh, activity, their pro mental health prevention. Uh, services. But in this study, we try to do a more robust analysis because people were arguing there might be endogeneity issues, you know, um, a rich county may have more resources to provide such services. So we try to adjust the uh, endogeneity concern by using the IV methods, which all pass the uh, robust test. So basically, the main finding, uh, which the paper published in uh, medical care in this, this year, Basically, showing that if the individual live in uh, the county with active mental health preventions by the local health department, the, lo the rates of encountered the readmission, so they, they all cause readmission, is significantly lower than the counties without such, uh, such prevention. And, and the one more thing I would like to uh, identify is that usually compared to Caucasians, African American patients with mental illness were more likely to encounter 30 day or course of readmission rate in the state of Maryland. So you can see the odds ratio is, ex uh, is like 1.2 compared to the Caucasians. However, if African Americans can live in the county with the uh, active support from their county department by providing the uh, mental health care, you will see the interaction term is, uh, is negative. So basically, it can drive down their readmission rates. So it makes us think uh, maybe, you know, uh, one of our hypotheses is that local health department probably can contribute, you know, because they function as a safety net for the people uh, with relatively uh, lack of health care resources. So maybe they can function and, and you know, can help address some of the disparities. So we uh, look at the preventable hospitalizations. So we use the uh, AHRQ, uh, develop the PQIs to see the uh, uh, um, uh, ACSC, in, in, uh, because a lot of the uh, people with mental illness also have diabetes and other, other conditions which, you know, May, may, in, may encounter preventable uh, hospitalizations. So we find that, that uh, again, uh, there are a lot of um, approach details I, w I will skip here. So basically it's a multi-level analysis to capture within and across hospital and the local health department uh, variations. And the, we also in this study, we try to tr uh, distinguish whether, you know, living in county with this local health department, differences in the local health department investment can help to explain some of the disparities that we have been observed in the preventable hospitalizations. So we, we apply some uh, decomposition methods and the results show that um, shows that for people with depression and, and anxiety, they will, they will be less likely to encounter preventable hospitalizations, you know, uh, 
with the uh, support of the local health department. And, the more, and the more importantly, in this study, we identified the uh, racial disparities. Uh, and the local health department role can actually help to explain the disparities by 8.6%. That means that in the state of Maryland, so there are a lot of variations in the investment by local health department. And the African American residents on average were less likely to live in, in counties with such support. And, and meanwhile, they encountered higher rates of preventable hospitalizations. So we were saying that the decomposition methods shows if the uh, the African American populations can receive the same level or more active local health department support, probably we will be able to see 9% re reduction in the preventable hospitalizations among these patients. So basically, we, ha we conducted, the more, but these are the main findings. I will be very happy to talk to you about the details and the, pro and the methods after the talk. But basically, we, we showed that it, all these study put together kind of suggested us that local health department can play an uh, important role uh, like from the public health perspective right to maybe can be cost saving as well to encourage you know more efficient use of the health care for people with mental illness so and, and you know we know public health 3.0 infrastructure reported uh, that you know yeah, we know many people we kind of spend over $9,000 per year per person in the United States. However, the investment from public health probably is only 3 or 5 percent. So, so we are thinking there are a lot of rooms maybe we can do, you know, to really improve the cost efficiency for the mental health care. But the, I, the question is how to promote the, this public health kind of integrated mental health care delivery, which we think it can be cost saving. So there are a lot of ideas going on, and from years of uh, collaborating work with the local health department in the state of Maryland and other states, we find that you know the main question is the financing support, the resources. Okay, so it will be ideally to actually involve like the big players, like the hospital settings, to really to to ask them as well to involve uh, and then invest in the population health and the public health infrastructure as well. So the, so for example, here are. I just list a couple of the strategies that hospitals, you know, usually uh, they can adopt. So, for example, one is the whether hospitals have been actively in promoting the community-based uh, preventions, whether they are committed to promote the population health in their community. And there are also other like uh, specific strategies they can use. Uh, as as presented by my earlier speakers is whether they use the case management, right, follow the post-discharge, whether they actually use some uh, health information technologies like a predictive model, right, to predict the risk or prospective management of patients with high risk. So the, we, uh, from AHA, uh, annual hospital association survey actually lists a couple of the care coordination strategies that hospitals can do and usually the, to, uh, you know, uh, how, how they were doing uh, in terms of promoting the care coordination, the public health integration. So these are just a few examples. So, uh, you know, because the title of this talk is the next big thing, so I'm thinking maybe I can think think broader. So, what is in my in our perspective? Because we we want to like think public health is really kind of like a cost effective potentially. So, how to integrate it, right? So, it's really a target of the population health and the care coordination. And there are a lot of policy initiatives, and obviously, uh, accountable care organizations, like presented by my pr previous speaker, is one of the major integrated the care model that's as, as ongoing. And uh, yeah, so which, which promotes the care coordination and also using the financing system to promote the such, such care coordination. And then there are a lot of types of the ACO and the generations of the ACO, MSSP, the Medicare shared the same is one, is, is a major one, which required, you know, measurement on the care coordination. I think there are several measurement requirements and also others. Yeah, but, but also, uh, as mentioned earlier, yeah, that there is no requirement on the behavioral health sector. So it's not like you know, we, you know, for the, each ACO team, there has to be a behavioral specialist on the team, and there is no discussion on the uh, financing model as well. So, so this part is lacking. However, this also tells us there is room for us you know, to kind of design the system better to, to promote the uh, public health integrated health care. So I will just present a very preliminary finding that we have because we want to see that direction to, to, to show whether we can use this in you know, ongoing opportunities right, to really improve the mental health care and the 
you know, involve the population health component. So the data we use are the 2015 American Hospital Association annual survey, and AHA actually issued a lot of supplemental surveys, which included the HIT, the population health survey, and also the care uh, coordination and payment surveys. So it's all issued in 2015. So we use the uh, area resource file, American Community Surveys, and the CMS webpage, Hospital Compare website to, to link the hospital care coordination implementation with their geographic area and, and the uh, service areas to see whether you know that vary and so on and so forth. So very briefly, our the, the example covers around 7,000 uh, ACOs, but it's, it's, these are all hospital-based ACOs. So that's nationwide, and the uh, amount of among this survey, uh, 269 were drawing the had part or whole entity of the ACO. So you will see the first panel uh, listed the uh, some of the care coordination strategies that the hospital have been adopted. So uh, comparing hospital with ACO or without ACOs, hospital with ACO entities are more likely to adopt those care coordination strategies like the predictive models, prospective case management models, and so on and so forth. However, you can also see that the ACO, uh, the payment system also varies significantly, okay? So most of the financial incentives under the ACO, it is still fee-for-service, but it can be fee-for-service, uh, the RGR per diem, and, and also you will see the shared savings, which I think is more, uh, yeah, it's, uh, uh, there are more, uh, like 11 percentage in the ACO models uh, compared to others. So these are the total revenue from the hospitals. Okay? And then also there are other types of the payment as well. So, so if, well, it's too early to establish any association, but I would, was, the goal is to see whether there will be room okay, to tell the different, uh, to, to, to see whether you know, the care coordination promotion can be varied by the ACO. Again, this is actually for the general population. It's not for people with mental illness for this, but that's for mental illness, it will be our next step. But basically, you will see that if the ACO, oh, by the way, all the ACO uh, association is, signi is positively significant associated with the uh, care coordination promotion, as we saw in the uh, previous slides, even, even adjust the hospital characteristics, okay? But and meanwhile, we also see that the ACO promotion of the care coordination really vary by their payment strategies. Some of the payment strategies, like a fee-for-service per, uh, per person, will, will really not be helpful to promote the uh, care, co uh, care coordination strategy. We only have, so far, we only have observed the uh, association between the shared savings. So the shared saving looks like 10 percentage higher will be you know, associated with more likelihood of widely adoption of the predictive models, prospective pay uh, management, and so on and so forth. So we are trying to say that it's a component of the ACO uh, itself, as well as the financing model. So how to combine them together well to promote the, uh, uh, the care coordination uh, adoptions. So, okay, so basically, um, uh, the last point I want to make is that if ACO model and the financing model is kind of promising, however, there is so much variation of the adoption so, uh, of the ACO models. So one of the studies that we did is that we, we use, we link the multiple data set to link the AHA hospital, hospital with their hospital service area. So we use a 15 mileage, the geographic relevant market, okay, to see you know, whether the hospital, where is the hus these hospitals are located, and whether their neighborhood characteristics will predict the adoption of the care coordination models. So very quickly, so this map shows the variations. So, so basically, what our underlying is that the uh, people living in rural area or high poverty areas were less likely to access the care coordination. These are promising strategies, okay? So the last one is which I will do an advertisement. Yeah, yes. <laughs> so, so Abby will give the poster very soon after our talk, so she will talk about the mental health care for, for the care coordination and observe the differences. So, so thank you very much. I encourage you to uh, ask your questions, comments uh, during the upcoming break. Actually, it's lunchtime. We run out of time a little bit. And thank you very much for coming and hope you will enjoy the rest of the conference. Bye.